Welcome to this week's Aiding Your Game. This week we're going to be focusing on building up a table that you can game with for an extended period of time. I'm going to give you my best tricks on how I've been able to garner tables that I've been able to play with over extended amount of time and how to keep players engaged as well as the story moving forward. Let's jump into it. Now, before we start the video, make sure you go down and hit that subscribe button to help us grow. If you don't mind the notifications, ding that bell. Give us a thumbs up if you like the content. Leave a comment on content that you'd like to see us cover on our channel. With RPGs becoming more and more popular each and every year, more and more people are joining RPG communities and sitting down to play and run RPGs than ever before. Now, as a longtime GM myself, I've gotten a lot of experience and I've gone through all the different phases that we've covered in previous videos on the different types of both players and GMs. Now, most people are going to go through these different styles of play in their RPG experience. Currently, I'm on the far side of story and RP over tactics and tactical play. However, I have gone through all the four different stages and I've really enjoyed being able to build up my experience in feeling out these different areas and styles of play so that I can best find the type of play that suits me and that I enjoy the most. Knowing your preferential play style as a GM is going to make a huge impact on the table that you're creating for other players to join. You have to know the type of play style that you are most comfortable with and that you really enjoy so that you can offer your best foot forward for your players. By taking some time to really think about the type of play style that you enjoy and you enjoy GMing, you're going to be able to really focus in on that style of play, create scenarios and encounters, as well as story and content that you can best represent and present to your players. Before you write down any campaign ideas or story ideas or anything, really spend a few moments just thinking about your play style. When you do this, you'll be able to really laser focus on the type of gameplay you want to do so you're not spinning your wheels or wasting times on things that you're not going to enjoy or you're not going to be able to represent well at your table. Once you have your story ideas or your campaign setting or whatever materials you're preparing along with all of your game aids including maps and handouts and NPCs and NPC locations, and so forth, the next thing you need to do is package it up. Because as you're going out and looking for potential players to join you at the table, you need to be able to present them with what they can expect by sitting down at your table. Putting together just a quick paragraph or two of your play style, your setting, and the type of game that you're going to present is really going to allow players then to decide whether that's the type of play environment that they want to join in or pass. This is going to do wonders for making sure that the players who come and show interest in joining your games are ones that are going to enjoy your play style and really take part in your storytelling or gameplay sessions. If you don't have a good fit at the table, your campaign won't be able to go through a long tenure. Just because people are not going to be invested you may not be invested. There may be a lot of clashing at the table. People will not be interested. The list just goes on and on. So by really summarizing your play style, your environment, and the type of play style that you're going to be presenting at the table is going to help build the community around you that you are going to really thrive in. So really thinking about the key standards and presentation that you're going to be putting out to garner players to come to your table is super important. I really recommend spending as much time on that process as you do in writing the bones of your story.
Now, one of the big things that I keep seeing online is that there isn't a Tinder for D&D or other game systems. And one thing that I found is there are a lot of social media opportunities for you to look for players or GMs that are in your area or can play remotely. With the COVID pandemic that really exploded the opportunity for online game and distance playing, there are so many tools now available that weren't available just a couple of years ago that finding games to play in or run have has really evolved and taken on a whole new life. But again, by going through and summarizing what your play style is, what your setting is, what your expectations are, and what the players can expect at your table is going to really start to narrow the field and make sure that you get the quality of player that you want and is going to emulate your input into the game with their own input into the game. Having to have moved quite a bit, I've had a lot of success with this. And again, I really think it goes down to a big part of it is the presentation that you as a GM put out for when you are looking for players. Setting the expectations, letting everybody know what they can expect when they sit down at your table is really going to make sure that the characters that you get in your game and the players that sit around at your table are a good fit for you. But it goes beyond that. Because oftentimes our presentations have to be short and sweet and to the point, we don't really get into a lot of the nuances. And as players really look at an opportunity to play, they may not spend the time really thinking about whether or not that's the right fit for them. So an ongoing process is super important to make sure that the continued play style is both effective in deliverance as well as meeting expectations for you and your players. Again, I've had a lot of experience in being able to do this, so my top tricks to make sure that I've got players who are invested in the game style that I prefer to play can be summed up with these simple steps. I always look for ways to encourage my players to impact the story. Again, as a storytelling and RPing GM, I think the most important thing is the evolving story of the characters into the challenges that I present. So I don't view it as my story, I view it as our story, our collective story. The primary antagonist is basically my PC, and how does that PC interact with the player's characters? So it's a collective story for all of us. So I look for ways that I can bring the players in, and that's why I'm really big on getting backgrounds and kind of the player characters thoughts and views and what shaped and molded them and how can I fold that into the overall story how can I bring tie-ins to their background and make those choices at early character creation meaningful how can I reward players for making sure that they've got a good nuanced character that has a rich backstory and how can I offer them an opportunity for that to matter on the overall story if they chose a sailor background but we're in a landlocked area, how can I still utilize that sailor's aspect, that background that the player chose for one reason or another to impact the story as a whole for either that character, the party, or the antagonist? Thinking about how to incorporate the characters better into my stories is a great way to reward players and make sure that they have a better investment in my games. Making the story meaningful for the characters as well as the players can be very nuanced. If we think about a big overall scheme and we create a great campaign and a fantastic story, but it doesn't really impact the players or hit them where it counts or touch on the players to have some type of a reaction to those, then we may as well just be writing a novel. By allowing the gameplay to have an interactive, meaningful impact to the player characters. Those characters then have more reason to partake in the adventures and continuing the process and seeing what happens. Sometimes many cliches have been used where they get attached to an NPC and the NPC is captured or killed or taken prisoner or turns out to be one of the antagonists. Those types of touches, even though they're cliche, 
are very impactful for the characters. Likewise, the player's investment also needs to be tackled as well. If they are only mediocrely happy with their character and they're not having a, a very good buy-in on the story or the NPCs that you're presenting, look for opportunities where you can touch their nerves. What's something that they're really passionate about? What's something that they absolutely have a phobia about? Now, of course, you have to tread lightly in these types of areas. But, for example, I have a player who I've played with for quite a long time, and one of his most favorite things is working and utilizing his skills, the skill sets that he chose from both background as well as leveling up. Those types of things are super important to him because he does that in his own personal life. He loves going out for things like wilderness survival and camping. He very much is connected with nature. So by utilizing those types of pieces and presenting it to him in a way that means something to him, talking about whether it's the land or the impact the antagonist has on forests or the foothills and mountains, it starts to elicit emotions from him. He begins to see that antagonist as really touching something that he, the player, is very passionate about. And it also hits his character because his character has a lot of the same skill sets that he enjoys. So he kind of puts some of himself in the character. And by utilizing what I know of the player and what he is passionate about, I'm able to elicit that type of emotion not only from the character, but from the player as well. On the opposite side of that, I have another player who is, really has a phobia about kind of public speaking and public processing and really that social aspect. I'm not going to put the player in that type of a situation, but oftentimes when they're doing something, whether it's good or bad, that can elicit a response from the populace. That really works on the player's phobia because when a crowd starts to gather in a town looking at what they've done and kind of judging them for it, it can elicit a response. They don't want that. So whenever I pull that out of my hat and start showing that any type of a murder hobo or anything like that is going to have that type of a consequence to the public in the campaign, it really starts to elicit from that player Maybe we shouldn't be doing the murder hobo because we're going to get a crowd. We're going to get everybody in our face. We're going to have a huge populist thing while some of the other players may be thinking, yeah, we'll take them on. It's fine. It really elicits from that player. No, calmer heads need to prevail. So thinking about and kind of utilizing some of the phobias and uh, interests of the players in your game through their characters and through your presentation is a great way for them to emotionally involve in your game. Now, oftentimes as storytellers, we're there really to tell a story and present a campaign and have a start, a middle, and a conclusion to our campaign setting, our campaign story, our overall story. But oftentimes we can be too railroady by presenting a wide option to our characters, we give them the choice to craft the story along with us. While it's true this oftentimes puts added work on us as GMs, that's the type of work that I enjoy to do because, again, it stays collective. I'm still able to realize the beginning of my story. I then just have to reshape the middle so that I can find the end. Many times i found that this really goes through and allows me to tell a better story. Because I don't want this to be a novel, I don't want it to be one-sided, I want this to be a collective story of the character's impact and interactions with my antagonists and the world that I've created at large, by offering many paths and pursuing them through allows us to either separate our ideas and work on that as a separate campaign for another day, or reimagine our ideas and look for ways that those impacts that the characters have would shape the actions and reactions of our antagonists and the world that we've presented at large. Now, I've found many times this has led me, as a GM, on new paths of discovery and coming up with ideas that I didn't initially plan for or think about. By avoiding some of the direct railroading and really presenting a open format for my players to move in, it gives them the opportunity to help create the story with me 
but this can also backfire and they may not have good ideas. That's where you come in to start laying some tracks to point them in directions with NPCs, with encounters, with different types of patrons or victims who can help steer them along a path. Now, if they're not picking up on this or you're not as concerned about the story as much as the tactical progression or anything like that, it's easier to do as you're looking more towards the storytelling and RPing piece. It's maybe a little more challenging, so uh, your mileage may vary, but the more experience you have, the more quickly you'll be able to rebound, keep a little bit of track laying, but let them help you build that path to the end. Now, I can't tell you how important reading the room is. Reading the room has really allowed me to hone my skills in both presentation as well as story building and collecting players around me. By watching how, when I present something to my characters, they react to those has allowed me to really narrow the games to make sure that I'm hitting the notes that they want, that I'm meeting their expectations, or driven me to ask more questions of my players. As a storytelling and RPing type of GM, reading the players is really important because I can quickly identify and see if they're invested in the story, things that they enjoy, they'll perk up and really get into things they're not enjoying, they'll kind of lean back and um, just not engage with. So I can quickly adjust and either bring them back in or reformat how I'm presenting things in future opportunities to really avoid any pitfalls. Reading the room and being able to really interact with your players is a fantastic way for you to make sure that you're getting engagement, that what you're presenting is being well received, and knowing if there's a good fit between your players and your table style. Again, this is a skill that I've had to hone over many, many years and many, many sessions. That's partly why I prefer in-person play, because I'm much better at reading the room when we're sitting around collectively a table. I can really quickly hone in on who is enjoying and who isn't, um, who's feeling excluded and who isn't. If anybody's really trying to hog the limelight, I can find ways to really set them aside and focus on the others to allow a more balanced table so that all of the players feel like they're impacting the game positively without being railroaded, without being stood up or walked over or treated like a rug and really hold the table at a very well-balanced level. Reading the room is definitely a skill that, as a GM, I think everybody should really think about how they can utilize reading the room to offer the most for your players as well as for yourself. Now, I definitely am one who really believes in pulling creativity from different opportunities and thinking about different stories and how I can blend different things that interest me into my campaigns. There's absolutely nothing wrong with looking for inspiration from different sources, whether it's books, movies, TV, Pinterest ideas, wherever you're pulling ideas from, really utilize as much as you can because it's already built. You don't have to start from scratch and build something. And it gives you a way to quickly get things together pulled together, look at how you can patchwork everything to make it work in your world, and if your players recognize it, it's okay. There's nothing worse than thinking that you've created something from scratch and someone else saying, oh, this is exactly like X, Y, or Z. So deflating for a GM. I've gone through that a multitude of times, and while it can be disheartening and really jarring for a GM, uh, by just opening yourself up to the opportunity to pull in inspiration from any direction and then giving credit when credit is due is a great way for you to say, yeah, these are the types of things that interest me that I pulled my interest from and you may recognize some of it. So use inspiration, use it as much as you can because it's going to help you in being better able to craft things together and present it out rather than having to scratch build everything from the get-go. What a time saver. Now this one goes back onto a number of things we've already touched, but 
communication is the key. By keeping communication high and strong and really allowing for open communication back and forth, your players, again, are going to be more invested in sharing table time with you. If you're open and willing to receive and give communication, your players will feel more rewarded than if they just show up for a two to four hour, six hour, whatever it is, and then having to stop and walk away. With some communication, you start building bonds that go beyond the table. You're allowing your time and the players are allowing their time to co-mingle away from the gaming table or your regular session process. These are the type of bonds where trust and community are built. While not everybody can facilitate 24 seven communication with their players or their GM, I definitely don't require the same from my players or offer the same to my players, but having open lines of communication where we can talk about the game or even some things that don't have to relate to the game, but at a modest level allows everybody to build more of a community. Community role playing is what it's all about. As we gather up at the table, I often say we're gathering with friends and family. Now there are times where we meet with strangers to start a game or to offer a game for newcomers or someone who's just learning or someone who's in between tables. There are many times where we meet at the table as strangers. But for me, the community aspect of it is even more important. By allowing ourselves to be part of a community through communication with our friends and family and the strangers that we meet at the table, we start to build a community around ourselves. People who enjoy working with us at the table and telling stories in playing these RPGs become more than strangers. They're more than acquaintances. They become friends and family to us. And while over time we may have to move away and start different games and start different groups and everything, that community while we're playing together is the most important thing because it gives us all an opportunity to share our love of the game a bit about ourselves and really drives home the fact that we're in this together, we're here to play a game, we're here to enjoy it together, and we can tackle issues. And while we're doing this, we're all on the same path together. So those are the tips that I've learned over 40 years of playing and over 20 years of GMing. I hope they're beneficial to you. I hope that as you're crafting your stories, building a table, working on getting a community built around yourself and your storytelling, that those help in some way, shape, or form. Now, in previous videos, we've talked a lot about how to build adventures, how to balance encounters, how to challenge players, how to utilize some skills to determine what type of gamer we are. Here at Green Oaks, we're continuing to put out videos that we feel may be impactful and helpful, but make sure to leave a comment and let us know what type of content is gonna be most helpful for you at your games as you're working on your RPG experiences and gameplay. We'll see you next week as we go over some of the content we put out a while ago and give it a refresh and cover some interesting ways to make your serial opportunities into story opportunities. I hope you enjoyed that video. Here's a link to another video that you may enjoy. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button to help us grow. If you'd like to support us, Make sure you check out the description of the video with some links and leave a comment to let us know where will your adventures take you.